I pray for the time that we're going to have the next few minutes that you will speak to us, give us new revelation about those Christmas stories. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to continue on uh, a short preaching uh, about two things. Number one is to remind us about Christmas. Number two is to set you up so that you can get ready for an amazing 2017. And uh, do we have scripture on the screen? Or you're going to have to take my word for it. In the six months, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And to a virgin betrothed a man whose name was Joseph and of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her, the angel came to her and said, Greetings, O favor one. I want you to, if it is your Bible and you're reading it, you need to underline it, O favor one, okay? O favor one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. It's like, what are you up to, angel? Verse 30, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God again. Again, underline that word, favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. 32, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of God, the Most High, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father. And he, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be so, since I am a virgin? So now she's like, how, how is that going to happen? This is impossible. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child to be born will be called the Holy Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her age, has also conceived the son. We read about that last week. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. I'm going to touch on that later on. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from the Lord. You know, a lot of people think, Thought. If you were in the religious circles, especially if you've been brought up as Catholic or Anglican or uh, at traditional churches and even Pentecostal and Charismatic, we've often talked about the amazing virtue of Mary, how Mary was so special and that's why God picked her. And God has foresaw that Mary is such an incredibly special person to be able to overcome all the attacks, all the possible attacks of friends and relatives. So she is very special. And, and if you're in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in Catholicism, you would also believe that Mary was born like Jesus was. She was immaculated. She was, she was born of a virgin um, I can't remember the, her mother's name, but she was also born of a virgin, and so she's also special. But according to the Bible, and if you don't try to read between the lines like what they tell you to, but just read the Word of God as is, you will know that Mary was chosen as a vessel like any of you would have been chosen. Mary was chosen to do the works of God, and she was to be able to do it not because of her ability, not because she was specially over, over more righteous. The Bible says there's no one righteous, not in the sight of God. Not until Jesus came, everybody was considered sinners. She wasn't super special. See, we all have this, have this thinking that saying, if God were going to use me, I need to be super holy. I need to be super special. I need to have certain gifts. I need to pay a certain thing. But the Bible said this. God says, behold, you have been favor of God. God has favor on you. He is giving you a break, in other words. You know, we all want favors. We all want favors. Favors is what opens doors for us. And you know, as believers, do you realize that God had given all of us the unmerited favors? Yes. And what does that mean? It means that it's not up to your ability or your righteousness for God to pick you. It is not up to whatever that you have done or haven't done or what rules you have kept to make you usable by God. 
There is nowhere in the scripture that tells us Mary is any more special than you. She had problems. She was a teenager. She was betrothed to, to Joseph. She, you know, she was just a regular person like you, like me. She probably struggled with a lot of uncertainties like you, like me. She probably had some, some anxiety about getting married to Joseph also, like you and like me. Like a lot of people these days worried about getting married because they feel like society had told them, the mass media had told them that, you know, it's a ball and chain. Like you and like me. She's a regular person. She was picked not because of what she did. She was picked because of the favor of God. You are picked because of the favor of God. The Bible says that he had given you the unmerited favor, which is the grace of God. Grace literally means unmerited favor. Some of you sitting there say, you know, I don't think I'm qualified to serve God or do great things. You know, every single one of you, every single one of us are qualified to do great things. You know why? Because God has said so. He had called all of us to do great things. I'm not telling you to travel in somebody else's lane. If you're not called to be, you know, some famous singers, then don't try to be a famous singer. If you can't sing especially. You can sing in the church, that's okay. People can, can enjoy that because it's the heart. If you're not called to be the next prime minister, don't try to be the next prime minister. If you're not called to play piano, you know, yeah, let's not go there. But that God has called each and every one of us for greatness. He has an amazing destiny for each and every one of us. I'll tell you, if you read throughout the Bible, not only in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, you would know that God pick whomever He wants to pick. Whether or not they qualify, whether or not they qualify in the eyes and the sight of men. Do you know who God has called to be David's great-great-grandmother? He had called a prostitute, a prostitute to be David, the greatest king in the history of Israel, to a, a prostitute and a non-Israelite. She was actually somebody that God belongs to a people that God wanted to destroy completely. The most unqualified person to be in the lineage, which Jesus would supposedly be coming out from. Are you here? So is David's grandmother, Ruth, another foreigner, a Moabite. you know who the Moabites are? Moabites were being despised by the people of Israel because they were the products of incest. Wow. But do you know that when God had decided that you become great, he called you to a special, special calling? And it's not because of what you have done. It's not of the school that you've gone to. It's not because of the money that you've given or not because of, of how you've kept the rules. It is always, everybody say always, always, always the grace of God. You know, some of you made some mistakes in the past and you fell short, you, fall, you feel like you fell short of the glory of God and you, you, can't, you can't reach your full potential anymore. I want to tell you that's a lie from the pit of hell. We all have made mistakes, but the calling of God, the Bible says, is without repentance. Now, God is referring to the people of Israel. He had called them, and the people of Israel, you know, they just wander off. They always sin against God, and they always, you know, reject the... the but the, the calling of God on that nation never changed. That's why God said the calling of God has no repentance. God never say, oh, I'm so sorry that I picked you. You know why? Because it is really not up to you. It is up to His grace. His, his great grace is over you. A lot of people think that, you know, going to ministry, you, you know, I can't talk about ministry because I'm in ministry. Uh, going to ministry, you need certain qualification. Do you know that the pastor of some of the largest churches around the world never been to Bible school? I'm not knocking Bible school. You go to Bible school to learn to grow. But you don't go to Bible school to get a certificate so that you can get approval of man. That's what Karis is all about, right? See, I'm giving you guys a plug. 
We don't go to school because we want to get approval of men. That's the worldly system. The worldly system requires some kind of paper, requires that you prove yourself. But the godly system is require you to understand that it is the favor of God, it is the grace of God. Mary was picked and was able to do great things with, with the ability to endure great persecution. You see later on. Not because she's special, not because she's like one of a kind, but because the favor of God is on her. And when the favor of God is on you, you are special. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are special. You say, I don't really believe that. Well, come on. You are special. You say you talk like those positive thinker, you know, positive talking. Uh, no, I'm talking, not talking positive. I'm talking scripture. Amen. Let's move on. I'm almost done. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Verse 29, and the angel said to her, don't be afraid. Here we go again. You know, last week we spoke about the things of God has nothing to do with fear. Every time when somebody tried to scare you into doing things, you have the authority to reject him. Because 2,000 years ago when Jesus came, the angels proclaimed peace on earth and will towards men. And every time when the angel of the Lord, or God himself shows up, they always assure the people they speak to, peace. Don't be disturbed. It's okay. But you know, a lot of people will come to us these days, and in the days past, is that they want us to, to, to modify our behavior. You know what they do? They're trying to scare us. If you don't do this, God is going to punish you. Now, I believe in the consequences of our action. That's natural consequences. But as far as sin is concerned, it's dealt with, done with, and God had laid all the punishment on Jesus. There should be no fear in your heart when approaching the throne of God. There should be rejoicing. He's not a God of fear. Religion preached the God of fear. But the God we serve is never the God of fear. He never wants you to come to Him because you're scared of, you got scared into you. He wants you to come to Him because you recognize His goodness. The Bible says that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It is always going to be the goodness of God that attracts you. Many of you come to church not because you were told to. I, have no, I don't preach that if you don't come to church on Sunday, God is, you're going to miss the blessing of God. Have you ever seen me preach this? In fact, sometimes I say, you don't even have to come to church. Don't come to church by force. But you come because you were attracted, hopefully, by the goodness of God. You are attracted to His beauty. You're not here because I'm so good looking, you just can't handle without looking at me. You're not here because I have such an amazing voice. None of you are here for that. You're here because somehow, somehow the Holy Spirit had got hold of you, gotten a hold of you, and He is attracting you. He's drawing you. You know, the other day I saw a gentleman coming to church, you know. It was on Tuesday, you know, and, and uh, he showed up at church. I said, don't you have work to do? He said, oh, I, I took a day off. He has something to do. I have some other things to, to take care of. And I said, so what are you, why are you here? He said, I don't know. I said, I think I do. Because the goodness of God had been experienced by you in this place so much that you always, yeah, when you come to this place, you remember the goodness of God. You're attracted to the goodness. The Holy Spirit, His love, His grace had drawn you. He went, I think so, because I really don't know why I'm here. So never, you, never be afraid. So, and so uh, the angel basically described what this, this child is going to do. And then, so Mary said this like all of us have said. Especially when we've been given a dream or a task or an assignment that is way beyond our ability. I often said this, if your dream is achievable by you, that's not a godly dream. Say it again. If the dream that you have is achievable by your strength, it's not from God. It's not bad. It's just not godly. You see what this means? Because godly dreams are meant to only be fulfilled by God, miraculously and supernaturally. 
When you were a kid, you had this amazing, wild dream that you had. And you, you, as you grow older, they say you become less naive. Have you heard that before? You, you begin to realize or you begin to understand the reality. And so you, you shifted your dream or you adjusted your expectation. But have you ever wondered those super huge dreams may have been implanted in your spirit by God? And that He had wanted to fulfill it Himself, not you? So if you had those dreams, I pray, and I said it many times in this church, that He will resurrect that dream in you. And this time, don't try to fulfill it yourself. Let God do the fulfillment in and through you. That's super big dream. Here, uh, Mary was given an amazing assignment that is impossible. She said, how could it be? You want me to get pregnant without getting married? So now she was thinking about her ability or thinking about the biological limitation that is surrounding her to complete her task. And we all go through the same thing. Every time we get an assignment from the Lord or we have a, an ambition, we have a dream, we, we just feel like, oh, may, 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 it's impossible. I can't do it. Because why? We look at our education. We look at our connection. We look at our experiences. We look at our background and environment, and we think to ourselves, we look at the mistakes we've made, and so we think to ourselves, well, not me. It's just a pipe dream. I'm just going to drop it. That's what happened to her. Because when she got an assignment, when she got a dream, she immediately f tried to figure out how she could do it on her own. And we all do the same thing. But the good news is, God never had intended for you to fulfill His calling, His purpose in your life, your destiny with your own ability. And that's why you've tried and didn't work. So this time, you need to do, listen to what the angel said to Mary. And the angel answered, and this is how it's going to work for everybody, for the calling that God had upon your life. Some of you have been called and, and you've made mistakes and you feel not qualified or you don't have the ability, you'll call. You, you know, let me say this. Make sure it is a calling. What does it mean by that? Don't allow somebody else's success as, as a means to your calling. In other words, don't let somebody else's success to become your calling. We see somebody, you know, it, I, a lot of people want to do a lot of things because they see success in certain individuals. They're so charismatic and they go, wow, I just want to be like that. And so they, 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 they use their success. Who doesn't want success? They use the success as, as a goal, as their calling in life because they saw somebody else uh, had been very, very successful. Make sure it is the calling of God. Make sure it's deep in your heart that it's the calling of God. Even if you've seen failures around you uh, by those people who are attempting to do what He had called you to do, still do it, like being a preacher. You know, when I started preaching, people say to me, this city is hopeless. And I've been given many, many examples of how pastors after pastor after pastors have failed. They open a church, they start a church, and they fail. And it's very discouraging. Because when you look at all those, you know, how the secular people, it's, it's secular value is getting stronger and stronger. And the mass media is getting more opposing to our values. And then our kids go to school. And every day they go to school, they're being bombarded by everything that opposes our faith. And then you go to work, you know. Uh, you know, you sometimes have to actually make excuse that the fact, the fact that you have a faith in Christ Jesus. They'll be nice asked to work on Sunday, you know. People disrespect our faith, you know. And you look at the environment and go, oh, how can anybody be successful in preaching the gospel in this city? You probably have better luck trying to open up a restaurant. But if God has called you, you're going to do it anyways. There'll be such a desire in you, oh, I just can't rest. I just can't rest. I just can't rest. And so if he has called you, this is what he's going to do to cause you to be successful. Pay attention for the next 10 minutes and I'm going to finish, okay? Number one, verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. 
when I am preaching under the Holy Spirit anointing, it feels like some wind is behind my sail, and all I need to do is just rest and let the Holy Spirit wind to blow me. I don't have to put a work in there. Some of you are extremely successful in business. It's because the Holy Spirit is in your sail. Lisa is having amazing, miraculous success beyond what she asked or ever think of. To the point where she said, I, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> this is too much. Without her sweating it. And the wind, I'm not trying to exalt people, I'm just trying to show you the wind is behind her sail. The Holy Spirit wind is. <laughs> if you find yourself striving and striving and striving and striving just to make some kind of marginal success, maybe you ought to ask where the Holy Spirit is blowing in your sail. You could be trying to sail in opposite of the wind. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, man, I tell you, it's easy. Everybody say easy. easy. God has called us to easy. Why? Because He hasn't called us to do it. He wants to do it. I preached about it a few weeks ago, you know. Jesus says, you know, the, the harvest is wide. The laborers are few. And then He went on and said that I am sending you into somebody else's labor. Somebody had work for it, and you don't have to. All you need to do is just harvest. I had a discussion with my wife yesterday. It was like an epiphany, you know. Um, it was like 12 o'clock. The lights are closed, you know, and, and so we were half talking about Bible. And uh, so I said, maybe we have gotten all this wrong, you know, because she was talking about sowing seed of the Word of God. Now, I'm getting controversial now, okay? Don't throw a stone at me. If you don't like what I say, it's okay. We are all under the grace of God, yeah? You forgive me, right? So, we're talking about seed of the people getting saved, right? And so, we do a lot of things in the name of expanding the kingdom of God and preaching the gospel. No, we do different things, you know? And then often after we finish doing them, I don't want you to listen to this very carefully, okay? After we finish doing them, we see no results. So to comfort ourselves, we say, well, at least the seed has been sown. Have you heard that before? At least the seed has been sown. And I say to her, you know, I'm trying to report, I mean, I went to the Bible a few million times, right? So I'm trying to recall, when is it that we've been called to sow seed of the gospel? You say, what, but Paul says, I sow and Apollo's water. Paul was talking about the, Paul was talking about his disciple, the, the people, I'm sorry, the, Paul was talking about, I am putting the word of God in you, and Apollo is watering it in you Christians. He's talking about how different preachers have different function of the word that's being preached to the church. But we're talking about the gospel, right? We're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. I believe we missed it all together. We've been focusing on the sowing when Jesus said, you look for the harvest. Come on. You look for the harvest because that's where I'm calling you to. Not to sow. I want to call you to the harvest. You want, I want to tell you to go reap. God has called us to reap the harvest. Our work is to reap the harvest. Sowing is hard. God is the sower of seed, is he not? We are the reaper. We go and... But the problem is some of us are trying to reap harvest in the wrong place. Okay, let's not get there. I, I, I'm just totally digressing. So the Holy Spirit will come on you. You know, I was just, we were just having a staff meeting this week, and we were talking about so many stories we heard. 
the people that have come into this church, we hear stories about them. They, they, you know, they, somehow they were inspired to come to church. You know, there was a brother, you know, he, he's working in the, in, in, the, in the construction, you know, and he's saying, I don't know what is going on. It's like, I can invite people and they show up and now everybody in my workplace is asking me about the gospel, asking me about my faith and, and it's like, he said, I don't know what's going on. It's like revival is happening. You know, when Smith workers with you to remember some of the stories, he would walk into a factory and people will fall into, fall into, fall into on the floor and start weeping and crying. That's reaping. It's easy. So I want to encourage you to look for the harvest and go grab the harvest. Just, so, just sowing, let, the, let God do the sowing. If I offended you, please forgive me. As for me and my household, we're committed to reap. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can sow. That's okay. God bless you. But I'm in the business of reaping harvest. Everybody say reaping harvest. I'm in the business to go and reap harvest. Number one, the Holy Spirit come upon you. And number two, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. What does that mean? What's the difference? The Holy Spirit come upon you is in you. But the power overshadow you. What does a shadow mean to you? See, when I walk, shadow follows me. Yes? Or are we following the shadow? <laughs> That's just for fun. There's no this philosophical meaning in there. I'm just having a good time. So I follow, you know, the shadows follow us. Do you realize that when you're walking in the purpose of God and the plan of God, the power of God follows you? You say, is that scriptural? Of course it is. You remember when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts, you know, he was so busy and they couldn't even have time to pray for people. And people would lay the sick under his shadow. And his shadow would heal the sick. What does it mean? It means the power of God is following him everywhere he would go. Today, if you're walking in the purpose and the plan of God, you don't even have to try. You know, I, I remember, I used to joke about this all the time. I'm a Pentecostal, so I can laugh at them, right? So it's like, you know, anyway. So, um, you know, I, growing up in a Pentecostal church, you know, I see a lot of the Pentecostals that try so hard to get people healed. And they would try, they would, they would try really hard. Oh, in Jesus' name. <laughs> And the people they pray for, it's like having a shower of blessing on them, right? <laughs> and then they sweat, you know, sometimes in those mission places, they sweat. They try so hard. Try to cast out the devil. Have you seen those people trying to cast demons out? I have. Man, sometimes I'm afraid. I'm not too sure I was afraid of the demons as much as, much as I'm afraid of the people who cast out demons. They're so angry. <laughs> You know, if you look at the police officer, right, all you have to do is look at the car. You know, I know all of you are like that because I'm, I'm like that. Maybe you're not like that. Maybe it's just me. Every time I see a cop car, I become more cautious <laughs> for some reason. And the weirdest thing is that he just stops somebody, his light is flashing, and we slow down. Honey, he's already in the process of something else, you know. So, so if you don't see that flashlight, you actually have to be more cautious. Now they see it, he's too busy. You can actually speed up. No, I'm not encouraging that, but I'm just saying, you know, we become more cautious just because we saw a police car. You know, those lights going. And you know, this day, some of those security, security, private security firms, they have those, those little light thing on top. They're not police lighting. They're just, just some light. And from the behind, they look like a police car. Sometimes they're scared by it. It's like, oh, there's a police behind me. And I realize it's some just... You know, nothing, nothing wrong with being a security person, hallelujah, just a security guard. He can't do a thing to me, right? So, but you know, when we see a police officer, we just try to drive slower. It must be fun to be a police officer, right? Just people are so afraid of you. <laughs> you know? 
See, when you have the power of God over you, that's how the devil is going to treat you. The devil is going to be, that's what you have, the power and the authority of God. I mean, here we are trying to yell at him and scream at him. and I love it when pastors and ministers, they don't even have to sweat. They lay hands on people and say, be healed. You know, Jesus is like that. Just be healed. He, he, he cast it. He said, get out of here. You know, when the, when, when, the, when the demons, legion, saw him, they were already afraid of him. They were afraid of him. Here we are making the devil a lot bigger than he ought to be. So the power of God will overshadow you. And it's overshadowing. Next time when you need to pray for something, don't be afraid. You know, when I was a kid, um, I was always afraid of the dark. And um, I will go to the bathroom and try to do my business as quickly as possible. That's why I spray everywhere. Oh, so sorry, sorry. <laughs> but, you know, just... And the reason is because sometimes too lazy to turn on the light, you know, like in the middle of the night, right? And that's why my, my mom had to... Poor mom. Anyway, so... Um, you know, you go, and, and you know, I ha always have this, because I heard in church, in church people, all the kids does the same. I heard a story about some green hands coming out of the toilet bowl, right? <laughs> so I was always afraid of the green hand, right? And so I'll be shivering, you know, just do my business, and then quickly run away, and as soon as I go close to my parents' room, you know, I go, ah, you can't get me now. But you realize the power of God overshadows you and that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Amen. Everything that rises against you in words will fall. The devil is powerless in front of you. Let's say it again. The devil is powerless. It's not because of you. It's because of what the Holy Spirit is doing. Because God of the universe lives in you. And that's why the devil is afraid of you. Amen. Because God lives in you. Debbie, could you please come? Is Debbie here? Is Debbie anywhere? Debbie? Where's Debbie? Oh, here she is. So, uh, I, I'm going to stop here because it's, it's a bit late. now. I'm, I apologize for that. So I pray that over the, over the course of the next few weeks, as we begin to look into the Bible, God will begin to reveal to you greater significance of this Bible stories that we've read a million times. And that it become an encouragement to you that you have been called to an amazing destiny and that every resource in heaven is backing you up. If you have been told otherwise, you are encouraged to reject them and cast them out. You are special. You have the grace of God on you. And the Son of God has laid His life down for your sake so that you can be the righteousness of God and, and can have great favor before God. And that His Holy Spirit can come and fill you up and that His power can overshadow you. That's our heritage. That's our inheritance. That's what we call the spiritual blessings that have already been given us. Already. It's a past tense. Don't have to ask for it, Lord, I want more power. No, no need that. Oh, I want more anointing. No, it's on you. The problem is most of us are not aware of it. Haven't come to that realization of the power or the, or the revelation of the power of God. Would you close your eyes this morning? Heavenly Father, as we come before you, and just remembering that amazing birth 2,000 years ago, not just as a story, not so that we can tell good bedtime stories, not so that we can, can, can have some kind of, uh, some kind of a good Christmas play, but that that is what you have prepared for us today to live out an amazing life. And that you have called us 2,000 years ago when you were born. You have already called us to walk into that destiny, to come into that destiny, to come into that grace. 
So I pray that not only are we going to have a great time in celebrating Christmas, good food, good friends, good social, but on top of that, Lord, I pray that in this season, we all have new revelation of who we have become in Christ Jesus. Who we have become in Christ Jesus. And the greatest gift is not what you can find at Best Buy or Walmart or Tiffany or whatever. But the greatest gift has already been given to us. We haven't unwrapped it yet. I pray that this Christmas we will start unwrapping the gift that has been given to us that contain all of the spiritual blessings. Some of us just unwrap a portion of the gift. We haven't completely unwrapped the whole gift. So we just realize a portion of the blessing. But I pray this season we will have this big unwrapping so that in 2017 we become people that will conquer new territories, people that will conquer new grounds to realize greater destiny than we've ever imagined. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.